Let's welcome everybody here today, New Start Reformed Church, and we're going to be in the book of Luke, <laughs> chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. So, last week we obviously discussed um, verses 17 through 19, and we talked about how Jesus came to to see the large amount of disciples and, and just the crowd of people that were there to hear Him. Not only hear Him, but a majority of them were there to be healed. They were there to feel the healing of the Lord and to, to truly see if that's who Jesus was. If He was more than just Jesus the Nazareth from Nazareth and He was the, truly the Messiah. So we're going to be in chapter 6 of Luke, verses 20 through 23, if we could stand for the reading and hearing of God's Word today. Now this section is known as the Beatitudes or, or the blessings from the Lord. God's Word says, starting in verse 20 of chapter 6 of Luke, and turning His gaze towards His disciples, He began to say, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who cry now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and exclude you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in the day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For their teachers were doing the same things to the prophets. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we come gathered to hear Your Word. We come gathered to, to worship You. You allow these people to, to hear and, and to, to listen to Your Word, to open up our hearts and open up our ears for this. Father, we, we know Your Word is pure and that Your Word is, is what it is. It is the genuine Word of God and we are to take every word, every word, with seriousness, with joyful in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So these verses here in Luke explain the, the utter dependence on God and instruction to the disciples to show this spiritual need to, to hear the teaching of Himself, ultimately the teaching of the Father. This is vital because even today the, the kingdom of God is at hand. We all know that the kingdom of God is, is truly at hand, but it will continue, continue to flourish no matter what we do. No matter what we do, the kingdom of God is, is going to continue to grow. But we all are, need vital teaching. We all need to understand the spiritual warfare that we're in right now that we are going to be judged for what we believe, that we are going to be judged to be Christians. We're going to be persecuted to be Christians. That's common, and it's been happening since Jesus' ministry, and it's going to continue to happen. And these are all spiritual aspects, and they're all vital, vital for the church and for growth of the church. Starting in verse 20, we read that Jesus turned his gaze towards the disciples. We can see that he wanted them, he wanted to, them to truly hear him. He wanted to be heard. This was meant for the twelve disciples before the masses could ultimately hear him. This was instruction. Jesus wanted them to, to hear Him, to prepare them for ministry, to prepare them to go out and, and to spread the Word all throughout the nations. And He was the teacher. He was the administrator. He was the one telling them what to do with bold commands. And when this great commission began, they wanted to, Jesus wanted them to understand the message wanted them to understand the mission. See, it was part of their, their teaching to hear and, and to understand because it helped them explain clearly what it meant to be a follower, a follower of Jesus, the Messiah. But in order for them to teach, they had to listen. They had to listen first. There's much more than just teaching. If you don't 
know what you're talking about when you're teaching. It means nothing. They had to listen and to take that information in and to understand the mission and to understand what the scroll said before they can teach. See, when you're a teacher, you have to go to years of school and, and to learn. Years of schooling. Somebody has to train you. Same thing for the disciples. Jesus had to train them. Jesus had to show them what it was about before they can go and spread it out to all the nations. So if we're not equipped of the gospel, if we don't understand what the gospel is, therefore we cannot teach that. Many teachers teach it and don't know it. We must know the gospel. We must know the word before we can teach the word. It's vital. It's vital for God's kingdom. See, it's here... Here in God's Word, it's clear that the Sermon on the Plain and then the Sermon on the Mount, as we all may know, had a significant impact on the early church. These sermons on This Sermon on the Plain was about to be delivered and it was vital. It was vital for the kingdom. Just as Sermon on the Mount was vital and it impacts discipleship. See, discipleship is what the church builds on. And if we don't know, once I stated before, we do not know what God's Word says, we are leading people astray, leading them the opposite way from God. We must understand God's Word. And it takes from, from reading it and understanding the context and, and listening to the Word to understand what the Word says. You don't just open it up and say, I get it all. God's Word is not easy to comprehend, but it's easier when you're filled with the Spirit because it opens up your eyes to see the words in the full context and full clarity. And in order to do that, in order to spread the Word, we talk about connecting others to God in our mission statement. We talk about equipping the saints for the Gospel, for God's glory. In order to equip the saints, we must equip ourselves and understand the context of the Word. That takes days of reading. That takes days of praying. That takes communication with each other to understand the Word. Understand we're not going to get it all by ourselves. We don't just sit there and read it and say, Oh, I'm ready to equip the nation. You are not. And so many people think they know the gospel and they try to equip and all they're doing is leading them astray. Stated yesterday that it breaks my heart to see many churches and many pastors leading people astray because they don't know the gospel. Because they don't know what God's word says. No, we, I, you are not perfect in understanding the word. We are all in our process. But it's important that we put our time into the Word. That we designate that TV time into the Word. That we designate time in our day to be in prayer, to pray over the Word, to understand the context. And none of that was in my notes. Praise God. Because <laughs> it's important that we understand our mission. That we understand that discipleship is vital for the church. That we understand that we need to know the Word first before anybody else can know the Word. And as a church, we are holding true to the Bible. We hold true to this Word. And it's up to us to understand it. It's up to us to spread it. And we can't spread anything we don't know. We can't. My kids go to school and when they listen from a teacher. The teacher teaches them and then they test them on what they're being taught on. God is testing us on our word every day. And it's important that we understand it. It's important that we're clear on it. You see, the early Christians made constant references to the early scrolls. They made constant references to the word because they knew the word. They made constant references to it. When the disciples spoke, when Matthew was speaking to Peter, 
they were talking about the early scrolls and about the Word. It's vital that we do the same, that we speak about the Word and we know about the Word. All of us are passionate about our own little thing. We all are passionate about our own little thing. We all have that one thing that you can say, I can go to Brother Cameron and I can ask him a question about this and he's going to give me an answer because he knows it. We can all go to, to Brother Jason and be like, I have a question about this because I know Brother Jason knows it. We all are passionate about something. Let us be passionate about God's Word because it's our salvation. We are all need to be focused on Sola Scriptura. And it's not because it's something to do or because the church tells you to do. It's because your salvation depends on it. Truly, your salvation depends on it. And that one extra person that needed to hear it will hear it from you and it will save a life. It will truly save a life for the kingdom. That's what is vital for the church. So we read these two sermons, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, vital for the direction on how to live from Jesus. They're, they're vital for the understanding of, of how to live like the Father. And what better better person to hear it from is Jesus Christ inside God's Scripture. It's better than any psychiatrist that you're ever going to go to. It's better than any doctor that you're going to go to for healing, but to hear from their true teacher. The true teacher that understands, that knows what God is truly saying. Jesus Christ. Jesus was always teaching. This is, is really significant because our goal is to teach and to teach people who have not heard what God's Word says. As Christians, we know what God's Word says because we put the time into teaching, into reading, into listening, into praying. That's what makes a difference. And that's what he was going towards. It was teaching. He wanted to teach. After he started to look at his disciples, he states, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. The idea behind the ancient Greek word for blessed is happy. But in the truest, godliest sense of the word, happy are the poor in the spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. No matter the situation, if you're a part of the kingdom of God, you are truly blessed. If you're a part of the kingdom of God, you are blessed. Nobody can take that from you. If you receive mercy, then you are blessed. You're truly covered with righteousness. There's no better feeling. The righteousness of God. Matthew 25, verse 34 says this. Jesus said that on the day of judgment, He would say to His people, Come you, blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Prepared for you from the beginning of time. You are being prepared. On that day, on the day that you ascend, you're either going to be blessed, or you're going to be judged. I would take the latter. You're going to be judged regardless of your sins. It's up to us for true repentance to turn away from those sins. And the only blessing comes from Jesus Christ. He knows what a righteous life looks like. When He's teaching, He knows what, what it looks like. He understands what a righteous life is, it, what it compares to from the opposite. He also understands how it is supposed to be and how you're supposed to live your life. He knows what it looks like to be a believer, which is one of the biggest life lessons. That's why he gives those instructions. This passage here is not meant to take as someone being poor. I don't want you to take it as, as you being, being tremendously poor in lack of money. But I want you to take, I want you to truly take this as spiritual wealth. Rely on mercy. We are thankful for mercy. Without mercy, we wouldn't be saved. 
James 2, 5 says, Listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and as hearers of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? Rich in faith. It doesn't matter how much money you have on earth. It doesn't matter how much money you have in this world. If you are not rich in faith, you are poor. You have nothing. You could be a millionaire and not have faith and you are broke. You could be poor, living on the streets, and have faith in Christ and be significantly wealthy. Praise Him for that. Spiritual wealth. Revelations 2.9 says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich in the slander of those who say that, that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. It doesn't matter about your wealthiness. It doesn't matter what your bank account looks like. How many zeros are listed in there? Negative zeros. <laughs> matters about your faith. You can't take that money with you when you go. But I promise you're going to be judged for your sins. Or you're going to have faith in Christ. You'll be wealthy. You will no longer be poor. The reward is great in heaven. And it's not anything, anything you will receive on this world. The true reward is heaven. Nothing else. Nothing else. We must grow in our spirit. The kingdom of God is what we, sh what we should strive for as Christians. And it's something that we yearn for throughout our lives. We yearn for the kingdom of God. Once we are saved, we are regenerated. And then we go through this process after salvation, called sanctification. This process will take until we make it to the kingdom of heaven and then we're glorified. Glorified. Glorified with the Father in the kingdom. This is something we should strive for throughout our lives and it takes spiritual maturity to do so. We must be spiritual, spiritually mature. We must not be a baby. We must grow in our spirit. It takes faith, true faith, to get there. The second blessing is hunger. Here Jesus states, Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. The hungry person seeks righteousness. The hungry person seeks the kingdom. They look for food and have hope to satisfy their appetite. The hunger drives them and gives them, a, gives them a single focus. And the single focus is Jesus and how I can be like Him. How I can grow in the Word. How I can show others who are hungry that they can be satisfied. The ministry should drive us. The ministry of Jesus Christ should drive us. God's Word alone should drive us. When we have connect groups at church, connect groups drive us because it's with other like-minded believers. Because they are hungry. They want to come to the buffet. They want to eat. They want to hear the Word. They want to take the Word. They want to live the Word. They look for food. Leaning on Christ should be enough. Leaning on Christ is, should be truly enough for us. We should be hungry for the Word. See, the Western society, the world, the rest of the world, outside of the church building, that whole Western society is not hungry. They love idolatry. They idolize other things. They idolize the non-biblical. 
the whole Western society idolizes outside of the church. See, the word is, is not appealing to a non-believer. The word does nothing to a non-believer. When you read the word, it doesn't give them butterflies. When you read the word, they are already full because they don't hunger for it. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of of God. It's foolishness to the non-believer. But the church, the church hungers for the Word. They hunger for Sola Scriptura. They want more of it. They yearn for God's Word every single day. We don't leave our Bibles alone. We don't leave it and collect dust. We wear out our Bibles reading the Word. We have wear and tear inside our Bible because we are constantly inside of it. With other like-minded believers who feel the same way that we do. That's the church. Matthew says it well here, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you are not hungering for the Word, you will never be satisfied. You will chase after idolatry. You will chase after things that make you feel good instead of understanding that what you do are sins and that what you should do inside of your heart, inside of the things that you do, the works, should glorify God. That's the church. See, a man longs to have a righteous nature. He longs to become more like the righteous of the Savior. A man wants to be sanctified, to be more holy. A man longs to continue in God's righteousness. Continuing in God's righteousness, a truly saved man does not go away from God, but connects more with God. Once they are truly saved, they don't want to get away from Him. They want more of God. They want to feel more of Him. See, today's society is hurting. The more the society falls away from God, the more tribulation you're going to see. The more it falls away, the more you're going to see things that are not holy. As Christians, we are to know that. We are to call that out. But we must gather together to do so. Jesus has given clear instruction in this strict in the scripture. If you're hungry for God, you will be satisfied. You will be full in the end and full on God's glorious grace and satisfaction. You will be full. But you need to partake in the buffet. You need to eat. Right now, the church is skinny. Church doesn't weigh anything. Church was always meant to be full. The church was always meant to be full of God loving people that love His Word and that live on His Word. At the end of verse 21, we read blessing. Blessed are those who cry now, for you shall laugh. Crying over sin with translations, other translations say weep. You may see that in your Bible. Weep. Society will cry over their sins. But the Christians jump for joy because they know where they're going. Those who weep can know something special from God, the fellowship of His sufferings. Philippians 3.10 A closeness to the man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief in Isaiah 53.3 The one who does grieve over spiritual condition condition can genuinely laugh when God makes these things right. We see in the media about Roe versus Wade being made right, about adoption being, not adoption, abortion being taken away. Praise God for adoption. Yes. Abortion being taken away. We praise God for that. See, suffering happens with the Christians 
Persecutions happen. The ultimate joy comes when it when we make it to the kingdom of heaven. That's the ultimate joy. And no type of good works can get us to heaven. Nothing that we can do can get us there. It's only salvation sent from God. No work can give us that glory. No work can give us the glory of heaven. There's nothing we can do on this world to get us to heaven. We must stay steadfast, saints. And hear these promises from the Lord with giving us clear instruction. Verse 22 we read, Blessed are, are you when men hate you and exclude you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Here's another blessing. We went over spiritually poor and hungry and weeping and you wouldn't think that you would be hated. You wouldn't think you'd be hated. You see as being a Christian as normal. But it's clear, persecution is everywhere for the follower of the Christian. Christ knew that the church would suffer from persecution. It would not be an easy road. Anything hard with tribulation will be rewarding at the end. We're going down the dirt road. The other road is paved the way the world likes to go down. We're going down a dirt road with heels. Hold on. It's going to get bumpy. It did not take long for these words of Jesus to become true to His followers. Early Christians heard many enemies exclude them, revile them, regard their name as evil. The ultimate rejection for the following of the Son of Man for aligning their lives up with Scripture in the end, they will relive the experiences of the prophets of the Puritans, we will all relive those. We will relive persecution. We will ultimately relive our lives possibly being taken away. How hard is it to think that you have kids, that you have daughters and sons, and because you're a Christian, you could lose your life. It's okay to lose your life for your faith. Because you'll be, be in the kingdom of God. Praising Him and honoring Him for your, your salvation. And to think many apostles who lost their lives. Many of the Puritans that were hung on stakes. that were, Their heads were cut off because of their faith. Are you willing to do the same because of your faith? See, when evil is spoken against a Christian falsely, such persecution carries a blessing of God. The blessing is paradise. The ultimate blessing is paradise for your faith. Persecution means nothing. shouldn't mean anything to the Christian. We are to stay steadfast in our faith. Stay steadfast in the gospel. Verse 23, this verse wraps up everything and gives all the believers all hope and an outcome from years of persecutions and hardships. God's Word says, Be glad in the day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for their fathers will be doing the same things to the prophets. Joy and persecution, you think, would be an opposite. When you think of joy and persecution, it's the opposite effect clear that we leap for joy knowing that we are going to do things to get us closer to heaven. That we are leaping for joy for persecution. Because the world thinks opposite. We lift our eyes to heaven all the time in everything that we do. The persecuted are in good company. The prophets before the apostles were in good company. They were persecuted. We will suffer persecution for our beliefs. The church will suffer persecution because we are a follower of Christ and we are not conforming to the world. Persecution is a given. Are we prepared for the persecution? Or are we going to go against God's Word and do the opposite? 
We cannot expect the world to act like heaven. We can't expect it. Let the world act like the world. We are to proclaim the good news no matter the persecution. We are to uphold the standards of Christ no matter the persecution. We are going to persevere. And the kingdom of heaven is our destination. <laughs> what do we have to lose? Do we have to lose anything? Absolutely not. Paul says this in Philippians to the church of Philippi. Philippians 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain for the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6, 1 said, Before of doing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is our destination and it's what we should strive for. Christ had good reason for warning them as, as soon as they succeeded to the place of the prophets, they must sustain the same contests in which prophets were formerly engaged in. The prophets suffered persecution. The disciples suffered persecutions. His followers will continue to be persecuted. The Lord suffered persecution. The wonderful sacrifice that paid the price paid the price that we should have all paid and deserved. The Father sent His Son to pay that price to be nailed on a cross and to die for us. And then we see glory that He rose three days later. May we be joyful and celebrate this, but let us understand that the crucifixion was persecution. He was being persecuted for what He was saying. But it's in the all, after it's all said and done, when we talk about the crucifixion, such a holy gesture. It's a gesture from God. A loving and just God. These blessings were given by the Lord of the disciples, which would ultimately start the church. The bride of Christ. Clear instruction He gave them. This was given right before He would speak to the masses and heal the masses. Once again, clear instruction for His followers and for His people. Loving instruction of protection. Next week we discuss the woes in this chapter and we continue this journey in the book of Luke. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we come to You understanding that, the, that we are going to be persecuted for our beliefs, for our belief in You, and that You sent Your Son to save this world. Father, please allow us the comfort needed and the tools needed to, to succumb to that, that we would spread this Word no matter if it takes our life. No matter that it takes our brother's life or our sister's life. Father, as Christians, we are known to be persecuted. And that's okay. The kingdom of heaven is at stand, and we want that. We want to be with You, Father, no matter what it takes. No matter if we're persecuted. No matter if we are in prison. It doesn't matter because of our faith. Our faith in You. Father, give these families comfort as we take Your Word, proclaim Your Word all throughout the nations, and that we are to honor You in everything that we do in our lives. We thank You for the true Teacher that was slain because of Your judgment for us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.